Howdy. Welcome to opening the black box. <laughs> My name is Dustin Yance. Uh, I'm at Mills Yance basically everywhere. Uh, I'm an engineer at Acquia, insert bad joke here. And uh, you can find the slides here if you want to uh, check them out later. Uh, so, the question is, what is debugging? Uh, I thought I knew, and then I started uh, going down this rabbit hole, which wound up writing this talk, and I learned some stuff. So just uh, these popped up just the other day. I really like these, just a couple of examples. Um, so there's a new uh, application uh, from the people at Palm Creek Software called Glitch, uh, which is an online IDE and hosting service for Node.js. Um, and it's a really cool way for people to learn. Uh, I'm, I really love it. Uh, I've been using it myself to learn some Node.js stuff. Um, but they've, they've also got a really great kind of community sense about them. Uh, so the other day they sent out this tweet um, my code once took down a client's internet mid-demo. Tell us your worst coding screw-ups. Found some of these pretty, pretty funny. Uh, Zach Holman, uh, he was one of the early uh, employees at GitHub. Uh, he once shipped GitHub to production in development mode. That was pretty neat. Um, uh, Jen Schiffer, uh, she's a, a JavaScript developer. Um, she actually works for Glitch now. Uh, she used to work for the NBA. And uh, apparently, she once took down uh, the entire Chinese NBA site uh, while switching the nets from New Jersey to Brooklyn. Uh, and as Drupal developers, I find this exceptionally funny because it was basically just a content change of one name to another name, and it brought down an entire site. That's pretty fantastic. Um, this is oh, this is just the best. My first client patch caused all their W2s, which is an American tax form, to print with the deceased box checked. It was a nunnery. I killed an entire nunnery. I, I want this cross stitched hanging on my wall. This is the best. Uh, and of course, I felt I had to I had to also add in uh, my own. Uh, I used to work for the University of Texas, various jobs. I worked for the library for a while, um, and I once took down the entire library website on the first day of the semester with a botched F FTP transfer. Uh, I guess it's better than finals week. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. There's a funny, funny story behind that. So what is debugging? Um, you're probably familiar with this page if you've done much Drupal development at all. Um, so this page, uh, you know, what could be wrong here? Obviously, the site is broken in some way. This isn't what we wanted to see when we pulled up the page. Um, so you know, what, what could it be if all you're seeing is text? Uh, one of the very obvious ones is maybe you've got CSS aggregation turned on um, and it's not cached properly or you, know, you download the, the database from production to local. Um, all kinds of things that you know, can cause the, the CSS to be, to be out of whack. Um, maybe there's JavaScript blocked in the, the user's browser um, or you wrote your jQuery poorly because you can only write jQuery poorly um, and it did something to the rendering of the page. Uh, maybe it's something a little deeper. Maybe sites default files, so the permissions are screwed up and things can't be written to that. And all of a sudden CSS and JavaScript don't exist. Um, so this, uh, it's kind of debugging, um, but in my mind, it's a little bit more troubleshooting. And we'll get into the, the difference. Uh, it's mostly semantic. For me, it's, does fixing this take five minutes or does it take five hours? Is kind of the, the line that I draw, which is a pretty broad line. Um, and is the problem fixed, in quotation marks? Um, or did I understand the problem and correct the problem in a, in a deeper way? So, what is this black box we're talking about? Uh, this is a little bit about myself. Uh, tell me if this story sounds familiar. Uh, I have a non-technical education. Uh, when I went to university, uh, I got a film degree. And then I went back and I got another film degree. Um, not a lot of money in film. And so most of my web skills are self-taught. Uh, when I was working in the film industry, um, everybody needed a website, and nobody knew how to make websites. I knew this much about how to make a website, and I turned that into making money. Um, and of course, definitely above average Googling skills. Um, I think this is the key to any successful developer. Uh, and probably, you know, I spent a lot of late nights staring at error messages. Um, See number three. Um, you know, this is where I came from. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't get a computer science degree. I didn't go double E. Um, you know, I didn't come up in that the very traditional uh, setting. Um, and so that led me to Drupal, which to me is kind of a black box. Uh, whenever you're working on something, it helps to have a, a mental model of what it is that you're working on. And for a lot of people, this is the mental model of Drupal. 
Um, it's just an impenetrable black box. All you know is you do stuff on one side and a web page comes out the other side. Um, after you've worked on it a little bit and you get a little more familiar, maybe it starts to look like this. Um, you know, you can, not only do you know how to use Drupal, you start recognizing Drupal. You pull up a web page, and you're like, oh, that's a Drupal site. I know exactly, hopefully it's not because they're using one of the default themes, uh, but it's very easy to start, you know, seeing the patterns um, and kind of the, you know, in the sense of the matrix, the kind of the code behind things. You understand what Drupal is doing. Um, but you still, you really don't understand what's going on. There's still a lot of stuff hidden from you. Uh, so this is where we get a little, a little, off, a little off track, you might think. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite books. Uh, has anybody read this book, Maniac McGee, Jerry Spinelli? It uh, came out in the early 90s. Um, it's a story of this, uh, this little kid, they called him Maniac McGee. Um, he lived in a, in a small town, um, and he had the uncanny ability to untie any knot. That was his superpower. If you had a knot in your shoes, a knot in your yo-yo, whatever it was, he could take that knot out. Um, so one day, he discovered there was a local pizza place. Uh, out front of the pizza place, they had a flagpole. And there hadn't been a flag on it in a long time. And the rope on the flagpole got all tangled up and all knotted. And it turned into what they called Cobble's Knot. Um, and so this was like the, the most gnarly, atrocious knot anybody had ever seen. The most impossible knot you can even think of. And there was a contest. The first person to untangle this knot on this flagpole would get free pizza for life. Which, you know, when you're 10 years old, kind of sounds like the greatest thing ever. Like, screw gold, screw Ferraris, I want a lifetime of pizza. This is Drupal 7. Um, so this is a, a workflow diagram of a very tiny part of the rendering of a page in Drupal. Uh, see any similarities to the, to the previous slide? A little bit, a little bit. Um, this is Drupal 8, uh, it's, a, it's a nicer diagram. Um, but again, this is a very small slice of the entirety that is Drupal. Um, so we have to realize Drupal is big. Drupal is dense, but it's not impossible. Like at some point, somebody sat down and wrote this, wrote this code. Like it didn't come down from on high. It was created by us. We can do stuff to it. So when you're having a problem, you want to start at the beginning. Um, so the thing about the thing about Maniac, when he first saw this knot and he first accepted the challenge. He sat down at a picnic table next to the flagpole for an entire day, and he just stared at the knot. He didn't touch it, he just stared at it. He followed every single curve that he could, he walked around it, he you know, kind of poked at it, but he didn't even bother trying to untangle it. And this crowd of kids that were sure he was gonna just like walk up to it, snap his fingers, and it was gonna fall apart. And they got really disappointed that he spent an entire day to them doing nothing. So he was just looking at this knot. And then the next day, he came out, and he started working on it. And it took him all day and all night, but he finally, he untangled this knot. Um, so the lesson there is we have, to, we have to have patience when we're working on these harder problems in you know, something like Drupal or just any, anything. Um, and in PHP development, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna talk about the tools that are available to us that aren't just the hammer, you know, not just clearing cache. Um, you know, not just downloading a fresh database, whatever it is. So we're going to start with text editors. Text editors, there's a bunch of different kinds, a bunch of levels. Uh, there's text editors and quotes, real ones, IDEs. Uh, so what does this mean? This is something like Notepad on Windows. Uh, this is something like TextEdit on Mac, Nano on Unix. Um, these are things that are very simple, very basic. They get the job done, but they don't do it very easily, very nicely. But at the end of the day, if it's all you've got, you can make something work with this. Um, from there, we get to step up into text editors. These are things like Notepad++, Dreamweaver, believe it or not, Sublime Text, Atom, uh, Vim. Uh, so one of the, you know, I think like a lot of us uh, who were doing web development in the late 90s, most of us started with Notepad. Um, and then a lot of us were just amazed when we discovered Notepad++. Um, so Notepad++, it's Notepad but you, you get things like uh, syntax highlighting, um, you know, like bracket matching. You get some really, some nice, neat things. Uh, Dreamweaver, so I used to work at a university. Um, the thing about a university is they've got a lot of money usually, but they never want to spend it. Um, so, you know, at some point they get talked into buying a, a campus license for all employees to have every Adobe product ever, 
and all of a sudden Dreamweaver is your best option um, because they won't pay for anything else. And believe it or not, if you ignore all of like the WYSIWYG things, it's a pretty passable text editor. You can do some really cool stuff with it. It's got plugins. It's got a little bit of community. Um, it's not so bad. Um, next, uh, in, in my my life, uh, Sublime Text uh, really changed the game. Uh, followed by Atom. Um, Atom is basically uh, GitHub's open source free clone of Sublime Text. Um, but both of these are the kind of editor that have literally every plugin you could ever want, any color scheme you could want. Um, they're really nice, uh, fully featured. Uh, and then we have something like Vim. Vim is kind of a religion. Um, Vim is available uh, basically everywhere in various forms. It's got a near infinite number of plugins for various things. Um, this is a terminal-based uh, text editor, so you're working strictly in a command line interface. A lot of people uh, get a little bit bummed out by that. There are graphical versions, but they, they have their peccadillos. Um, but these are all things you know uh, to check out. Find what's good for you. It doesn't, like, none of these is better than the other. Um, it's all about finding what works for you. Um, the next step up the ladder is IDEs, or Integrated Development Environments. Um, this is where I currently am on this learning scale. Um, this, is, this is new to me, and it's kind of, kind of excellent. Um, the big one for us is uh, PHP Storm. Um, so this is made by a company called JetBrains, based up in the northeast of uh, the US. Um, and this, you know, for PHP development, this is, you know, it's as custom designed for PHP development as it can be. Um, this can not only let you write your code, uh, it will help you write your code. It can know how Drupal is built. It knows all of the functions, all of the hooks. Um, if you're working in Twig, it knows all of the Twig functions, all the Twig uh, things. And it will like recommend these to you, which is it's really amazing. Um, it has integrated debugging. Um, it has uh, just so many things. Um, another option is Eclipse. Um, this is a, a more general purpose uh, IDE. It has plugins for things like PHP. Um, it has plugins for you know, lots of different languages, lots of different frameworks. Um, there's another one called Komodo, uh, which somebody pointed out to me. Uh, I've never used this one, uh, but a lot of people like it. Um, I think it probably, I think it came from Linux and is now kind of spreading to other platforms. Um, but so these are, uh, let's see, so Eclipse and Komodo, uh, I believe both of those are currently free. Um, PHP Storm you pay money for. Um, and that's the main thing I think that keeps people away from it. Uh, it used to be one of those things, you know, like Adobe, it would cost like $700 and you owned it. Um, but now they're doing the annual licensing. So I think it's like $100, $150 a year. Um, they have really great uh, you know, like student versions. Um, and if you just want to try it out, uh, you can download it and try it out for free for I think 30 days. Um, and I highly recommend it. If you, if you get paid to do your work, it doesn't hurt to pay for your tools. Um, that's the way I, I like to look at it. Uh, and my, I've definitely, you know, my game has been stepped up since switching to PHP Storm um, because it's just so much smarter. Um, let's see. And then, of course, there are operating systems with built-in text editors like Emacs, um, which is a, a really bad nerd joke. Uh, so in the, in the Unix world, the Linux world, Vim and Emacs are kind of the, the yin and the yang. Um, you pick one or the other. I tried using Emacs recently, and it was just, wow. It's amazing and awesome and terrifying all at once. It's like, it is literally an operating system that has, you know, it's a text editor, but it has a calendar built in, has a to-do list built in. It's ridiculous. Um, but if that's the kind of thing you're into, it's really nice. Um, let's see. So we, we have our editor. Now what about our environment? Um, you know, probably the, the first place everybody starts is directly on the server. Um, so you, you log into the server, you FTP into the server. Um, this is the, the production, the live machine. Um, maybe a little bit later, uh, you figure out how to do stuff locally, um, and have it work right, and then you can you know, move it up. Um, maybe you go down the, the road a little bit, and you, you know, turn your machine into something that acts like the server. So we'll get into some of those. Um, so uh, when you're you know, working directly on the server, FTP development, this is often called cowboy coding. Um, uh, let's see, you know, local environments. Uh, oh, so we'll just talk about FTP. This is where the, uh, the funny story from earlier comes in. Um, so when I broke the library website on the first day of the semester, it was because uh, I was FTPing some code over and included a change to the HT access file which in an Apache server is one of the most important files you can have. Um, 
And the FTP client I was using truncated the first two letters of the file, just chopped them off. I had no idea because I moved the files over, it gave me the green checkbox, and all of a sudden the site didn't work. Um, and uh, it's important to note that the, <laughs> this was not that long ago. This was like 2014. Um, but again, universities don't like to change. They don't like to spend money. And the person who was in charge of the servers would only let us work in FTP mode. He refused to think about anything more modern than that. Um, so that was fun. Uh, but it gave me an excellent argument to kind of up the, up the game, which we'll talk about in a sec. Uh, if you're looking at local environments, you're looking at stuff like MAMP, LAMP, Vagrant, WAMP, um, all kinds of things that make your computer act like a server. So you're, you know, you're running Apache, you're running MySQL uh, locally, just like it would look on the server. Um, then we have next generation stuff like Calibox uh, and Drupal VM. And these are, this takes Vagrant to the next level. So um, Drupal VM in particular, uh, done by a guy, uh, Jeff Yearling, who is, I don't know how he finds the time in the days to do all the wizardry he does. Uh, but it's a vagrant stack that is tuned, as tuned for Drupal development as I've ever seen. It's got every like, add-on and extra feature you'd ever want. Um, it has probably the most important one, where it will catch mail that is being sent from your server, so you don't accidentally email all of your clients every time you're working on a page. That's really nice. Um, Calibox, uh, it's done by a group uh, called Calamuna out in the Bay Area. Um, this is a Docker-based setup. So instead of Vagrant, it's Docker, which uh, has its pluses and minuses. Um, but this is specifically tuned uh, for different hosting platforms. So Pantheon and Acquia, and I think they have a plugin for Platform SH now, um, where they know the specs of a Pantheon server down to you know, like the, the version of a specific uh, piece of software, and they're able to replicate that perfectly. Um, which is really cool, and it means that you can log into Calibox, sync the Pantheon site, work on it, hit sync, and then it's on your Pantheon, uh, on the Pantheon platform exactly as it was on your computer, um, with some of the like the, the best uh, precision I've seen, which is really cool. Um, FTP. So, the biggest problem with FTP development uh, is you don't have version control. Um, version control is usually uh, done with Git. That's what we use in the Drupal world. Um, and what this means is you're able to take snapshots of your code um, so you can step forward and step backwards and you know exactly what happened. You know, I was working on this file, I saved it, I put it into Git. Um, so going back to the HD access issue, because we didn't have version control, I didn't know that a file had been changed. I only knew that the FTP client told me everything was good, even though it really wasn't. Um, so you know, it gives you very little um, debugging visibility, which is a real bummer. Um, and maybe you get log files, maybe you get debug statements, maybe you get watchdog logs directly out of Drupal. Um, you know, this is, if you have to do it this way, you can, but this is not the ideal way. Um, let's see, so what is a debug statement? So this is, you know, you're working in PHP, so you have print R available to you, uh, which can give you just a raw dump of any given variable. Um, so if you're working on a theme, and you're like, oh, how do I get this one particular thing out of the content blob? You can print R all of content and find exactly the name of the, of the, the property that you're looking for. Um, that would look, you, know, you can do something like print R node. Um, a little, little hack, if, you're, if you have to do this for some reason, you can wrap this output in pre-tags, um, and that will format things a little bit nicer, so it's a little bit easier to read. Um, specifically, specific to Drupal, we have DSM uh, in Drupal 7 and Kint in Drupal 8. Um, and these give you really nice formatted dumps of whatever variable it is that you want to look at. Um, so not only will it be formatted, but it'll be collapsible. Um, makes it a little bit easier to define what you're looking for, um, which is really nice. Um, when you're working with Kint, you have to be a little bit careful because it can be kind of overly aggressive in the amount of output it gives. Um, and it will literally crash your browser if you give it too broad of a variable. Um, so you gotta be a little bit careful with that. A lot of people run into that problem. There's a lot of really good blog posts on getting around that. Um, uh, so, back to local development. Uh, so MAMP, uh, Dev Desktop is a project at Acquia um, that gives you a, a local MAMP uh, that looks like the Acquia stack. Um, if you're on a Unix server, or a Unix computer, Linux, uh, FreeBSD, 
um, you can set up native lamp directly. If you're on a Mac, you can set up native uh, lamp. In this case, the code is running entirely locally on your machine. Um, you get the added bonus of offline work. Um, so, you know, one of my all-time favorite things, now that I live in Boston, um, every once in a while I'll take the train to New York for, for business, and that's four hours where I can just like sit there and work. And I don't have to worry about anything. It's better than a plane because you actually get room to spread out, you get a power plug. Um, but I don't have to worry about being connected to anything, um, which is really nice because everything can live on my laptop. Um, with this, you get, you, know, you get your print, you get your DSM, you get your Kint, uh, but you also get more. This is the greatest thing, uh, one of the most impenetrable things, but the greatest thing, uh, xDebug. Um, so this is what they call a, a step-through debugger. Um, there are step-through debuggers for various languages. xDebug is specific to PHP. And what this lets you do is you can actually pause or stop the execution of your script and see what something looks like at that exact moment. Um, so if, say you're working on a form and you submit the form and the values come out the other end wrong, you can set up xDebug. Um, PHP Swarm is really great for setting up xDebug very easily. And you can go step by step and see exactly what function is messing up the output of your uh, data, which is really great. Um, most, like, I think the, the biggest thing that separates a text editor from an IDE is the integration of uh, step through debugging, which is it's really nice. Um, so yeah, so we have Calibox, uh, which gives us Pantheon, Acquia integration, uh, Drupal VM is just one of many custom vagrant boxes that are out there that are available, um, but for Drupal purposes, it's the best that I have interacted with. You're going to get your print, you're going to get your DSM, you're going to get your Kent, you're going to get your xDebug. Um, and you can actually take it a step further because these are designed to look like the server that your content is going to live on. You can do stuff like really accurate performance profiling. Um, so if you've ever had the problem where on your laptop everything is super fast and super snappy because you've got you know, like a brand new MacBook, but you go and you put it on the server and all of a sudden every page is super slow, um, these, uh, I know that Calibox does this, I know that Drupal VM does this, other ones do. Um, you have built-in performance profiling, so you can see exactly what is slowing everything down. You can see that, oh, I'm accidentally making nine calls into the database when I only need to make one. Um, and that can speed up everything by 100% very easily. Um, these are things like XHProf, uh, which is a uh, Facebook product. Uh, this is, it's kind of dying off right now, uh, but it's being replaced by things like Blackfire. Um, there's a new one that I just ran across called Tidewater. Um, Blackfire and Tidewater, both, uh, they have commercial projects, commercial products that you can buy, but they are still available as uh, free things that you can install and use locally. Um, so if you go looking at their websites, don't be turned off by that. Um, they're going to try to sell you stuff, but uh, for the most part, uh, everything that you need can be had easily uh, and for free. Um, so yeah, so this is, you know, it's going to tell you how many times am I dipping into the database, how much RAM is a specific page using, um, those kinds of things, which is really nice if you have uh, performance issues. Um, so we're going to talk about XDebug in specific just because it's a, it's a very tricky topic. Um, so step through debugging. It's, you know, again, it's hitting pause on the code execution. Um, it lets you inspect the current state of the stack. Um, so you may have heard of this term, the stack. Uh, what does that really mean? When you look at Drupal, it's got hundreds or thousands of files of PHP code. Um, when you do a thing, you're, you're, you know, there's a trace that's running through all of those different files. Um, and that is the stack. It is the stack of actual file names that you are weaving through to get your output. Um, so this lets you, you, know, you, can, you can literally watch these stack up, up and down, uh, as you're going one by one through this. Um, and this is something really cool. You can modify the values live, uh, which is probably my favorite part of step through debugging. Um, so really, a simple way to play around with step through debugging is uh, in your browser. Um, yeah, I use Chrome for development because they have some really nice developer tools. Uh, one of the things they have is a JavaScript step through debugger. Um, so you can just load up any random page and you can hit pause and you can go step by step and watch 
all the individual JavaScript things fire off on a given page. Um, and you can go in and you can modify values live and see how it reacts. Um, so you know, why would you want to do this? Uh, again, you, know, you put something into the content box and then what shows up on the page is different. Um, so why is that different? What is, you know, what is causing that to happen? Um, I had an issue uh, with a, a learning management system where you know, every time you completed a course, you're supposed to get so many points for that. And when you get to a certain number of points, you know, there's something you're supposed to unlock so you can do something else. And people weren't able to get to that next level. Um, and it was very confusing. Like we looked at the code, everything seemed like it was right. We had, you know, it was, it was a bunch of uh, if-thens. Um, you know, we, we had everything everything accounted for. Uh, but what, what had happened was um, these part of this uh, the cycle involved a cron job um, to sync something back to a central university server. Um, and if you went through the if you went through the lessons too fast you got ahead of the central server, and it would start returning negative values, uh, which was super weird and super fun. Um, and the only way we could see that was you know, to step through and see that, oh, we're now getting back something negative. Uh, that shouldn't happen. Like, these are, <laughs> should only be positive numbers. Um, and we were able to prove that that was the problem um, by pausing it and in injecting different values live and seeing that, yes, it actually did do what it was supposed to when we injected those values. So then we just had to figure out how to make those two match up. Um, <coughs> so that's, you know, that's some of the, the tools that you should, you should check out if you haven't uh, used them before. So now we get to get back to debugging. Um, I used to work uh, in support. Um, I spent two years doing that, uh, which meant that, uh, you know, basically, this is my life. Something is broken. Um, I get an email, I get a one client somehow got my cell phone number and I would get text messages and phone calls. That wasn't cool. Um, so, you know, when you're working in this kind of environment, your default state is kind of uh, panic and terror. Um, somebody calls you, something is wrong, the site is down, uh, so-and-so can't log in. Um, to them, it's always this. It's always the worst thing that could possibly happen. Um, here's step number one. Relax. Uh, it's, it's hard. This is the last thing you want to do because every external influence is telling you to panic. But this is the first thing you have to do. You have to stop, you have to sit down, you have to look at the knot, and just relax. Uh, I love this tweet. Uh, DHH, uh, he's one of the, he's the, the founder and main guy behind uh, Ruby on Rails. He's, he's their version of Dries. Um, so unless you're making software for rockets, Self-driving cars or pacemakers ease off the mission critical bullshit, yeah? Does <laughs> um, anybody here work on nuclear missiles? Um, anybody in uh, air traffic control? Okay, so at the end of the day, we can all relax. You know, like nothing that we touch generally is that bad. Um, you know, I think uh, the worst thing I have ever done is kept a client from making money for an hour. And that's a bad thing. Like people need money to keep companies going. Um, but I, you know, to me, that hour of downtime is better than leaving. You know, like doing some kind of quick fix to the site, putting it back up, and then dealing with all of the, the bullshit that comes out the other side. Um, you know, sometimes you have to convince people. Like, no, like the best thing to do is just just seriously relax. That's all we can do. Um, if you do work in a missile silo or air traffic control, it's a totally different thing. Um, I'm sorry, uh, that's gotta be a stressful job. For the rest of us, uh, we need to remember the knot. Uh, we need to know that getting angry with this knot isn't gonna help, knot doesn't care. The knot is a knot, uh, it doesn't have emotions. Um, getting frustrated with it isn't gonna help, getting angry at it, cursing at it, spitting at it, none of that is gonna help. So we need to figure out what's broken. Uh, this is probably one of the hardest things to do in, in you know, fixing something, debugging something, is figuring out actually what is broken. Um, so is something not showing up that should be showing up? Um, you know, things like, is it new content that somebody just published? Is it published? Do they accidentally uncheck the box? Or do they set the wrong workflow setting? You know, make sure that if it's supposed to be published, it's actually published. Um, is it old content that disappeared for some reason? 
Uh, did permissions change for some reason? Um, you know, is the person logged in? Uh, do they have the right permissions to see the thing? Uh, this is always fun. Is something showing up that shouldn't be showing up? Um, you know, maybe it's uh, something like raw HTML or JavaScript being dumped out onto the page um, because somebody found some cool new thing on a website and copy and pasted it into the WYSIWYG field and it wasn't properly caught. Um, so, you know, you start to think about like the, the, what is the problem here? And let's work from the bottom up. Uh, one of the first places I like to look for particularly hard things is the log files. Uh, here's the thing about log files. You should know how to find the log files before you need to find the log files. Um, you'd be amazed at how many times uh, people don't think about this until it's too late. Um, so what this means is, you know, know where your, you know, if, if you have uh, Watchdog turned on, know how to access it. Know that it is turned on and you can access it with your permission levels. Um, you know, at Acquia, most of your log files are going to be rewritten somewhere else. So you have to know where to find that. Um, if you're using, you know, a lot of times performance engineers will turn off Watchdog and redirect it to the system log locally on disk. So, you know, your Drupal logs will be sitting next to your Apache logs and your PHP logs. Know how to find those. Know that you have permission to get to those log files. Um, this is a tool I really love called Multitail. Um, you know, if you've, if you've looked at logs on a, on a Linux server, you've probably used tail, uh, which lets you not only view the logs, but view them live as they're streaming. Uh, Multitail takes it one step further. It lets you do really cool things, like you can look at multiple log files in a single window. And this is really nice, particularly in the, con in the, in the constraint of Drupal, because you might have something showing up in your watchdog logs and your PHP logs every time you refresh the page. And then you can quickly correlate those two, which is really nice. Um, and on top of that, you can color code everything to make it really easy to see the new stuff as it's scrolling through. Uh, Multitail is really great, super recommend it. Um, so we have an idea of what is broken. So now we need to figure out where is it broken. So again, Drupal, pretty big. We need to know where the problem is. Is it a custom module? Um, you know, do you have a custom module that has changed recently? Um, has somebody put something into a template file or the theme file um, or into the theme itself? Um, so these can be things like, uh, you know, in a custom module, even little things like mismatching your quotation marks can break a page very easily. Um, things in your template file, you know, maybe you call for a variable that doesn't exist. Um, that can break things really quickly. Um, so, you know, it's, it's good to know how the site is built. You know, the, the thing about Drupal is there's as many ways to build a site as there are people building sites. You know, we have people that are pure site builders, and all they do is click through the UI to add content and add content types, um, and there's a thousand ways they can break things there. We have other people who they only write custom modules for everything. Um, I, I had a, a short-lived stint at a company uh, that refused to use views because they thought views were bad. So when you were building a page, you had to write a custom module for that page, and you had to write your own database queries. And it was not the ideal way to do Drupal, uh, but they were a WordPress shop, so what did they know? <laughs> but you know, when you're working on that kind of site, you have to know, you know what would normally be in views is not going to be in views. You don't have that skill set to use right now. You have to go and dig through the code. We have to know what module is doing what. Um, you know, it's, really, it's really useful to try and find, you know, if it's an error message or if it tells you like a specific thing is wrong, you know, like find the most specific piece of that error and then search the entire code base for it to see if you can find where that would have been generated. Um, so, you know, uh, at a certain point, you, you know what's broken, you know where it's broken, uh, but don't forget, Everything's still broken. People are still yelling at you. Uh, people are still like, hey, man, this, this is still not working. Uh, so again, we just got to relax. And hey, let's use the scientific method. Uh, I think this is kind of going out of fashion in America, sadly. Uh, but let's get back to it. Um, so this is debugging to me. Debugging is methodical. You're changing one thing at a time, only one thing at a time. You're testing that change. 
and then you're repeating. Um, so again, when you're stressed out and people are yelling at you, it's very, uh, you know, it seems very terrible to just try the nine things you can think of to fix it all at once. And maybe that fixes it, but maybe it breaks something else a month from now. And you have no way to correlate those two because you changed everything at once and you didn't test it each step of the way. Um, when you're changing that one thing, reverse it. You know, Make the change. Did it fix it? No. Okay, reverse that. Try the next thing. Only after you get through the simple stuff can you start combining things. Um, one thing at a time. Uh, Git is your friend. Um, believe it or not. Uh, one of the things, so if you've used features, um, or in a Drupal 8 you've got content uh, config management, um, these are really great ways to take all of those checkboxes from the page um, and store them in code somewhere, which is really nice. Um, but when you do that, it's helpful to put all of that into a Git repository. So you can see visually all of the changes that have happened to a specific thing. Um, so again, thinking about permissions. You know, commit your, your permissions to a Git repo, and then you can see who changed what permission when, and you can correlate that to something being broken now. Um, it's helpful when you want to save your progress as you work. Um, so as you're changing things, if, it, if the thing that you did fixed it, recreate that feature or dump that config immediately. Um, because you know that that's the thing that's going to fix it, and that's going to keep it fixed down the road. So somebody doesn't accidentally undo that checkbox later and break things again. Um, Git is really nice because it makes rabbit holes manageable. Um, you know, maybe something isn't currently broken, but you're just working on something, and it's you know seven o'clock at night, and you realize you're still working on that thing, and you finally fix it, but you don't remember all of the things that happened between nine a.m. and seven p.m. because you've just been staring at the keyboard. Um, so as you're working, if you're making small Git commits, you're leaving notes for yourself. You know, you're leaving a trail. Uh, so that you can remember how you got where you wound up. Um, Git bisect as your friend. This is something I, I've recently started trying to use, which is really cool. Um, this is a command that lets you isolate changes between commits. So we'll, I'll show you a, a diagram of this in a sec. Um, but the thing that's nice about this is if you have 20 changes between point A and point B, this helps you isolate between those 20 changes really quickly. Um, there we go. So, uh, this is a picture from The Art of Debugging, uh, which is a really awesome free book that I have linked at the end of these slides. Imagine you are looking at the factory floor of a uh, factory that makes teddy bears with Christmas outfits on. And, you know, uh, a raw teddy bear goes in the front, and a completed teddy bear is supposed to be coming out the other end. Uh, but it's a little bit jumbled up. And we've got, what do we have, 45 different stations where actions are occurring. So what is the quickest way to determine where the problem is? Um, I don't like to say this often, uh, but the answer is math. And the answer is in the middle. Um, so you check the middle, you bisect this chain of events. Um, and then you, know, you, you have an A and you have a B. And so you check the, you, know, you open that door, is the teddy bear in the proper state, yes or no? If it is in the proper state, then the problem is somewhere further down the chain. But if it's already messed up, you know what happened upstream. And you can start bisecting backwards. And so by going half, 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 you're able to quickly zero in on the exact problem that you ran into. Um, so with web development, this is really nice. Because you know, if you're working on a, you know, a custom module um, and you're doing a bunch of things, an unexpected error comes out when it goes to QA. If you have 20 git commits instead of one git commit, you can bisect between those and find where that error occurred really quickly, make the change, and then the rest of the code is fixed, which is really nice. Um, Angie Byron had a really good blog post on this recently on her blog, uh, WebCheck. Um, so you should check that out. She's way smarter than I am. Um, git diff is your friend. Um, so git diff uh, is the tool that tells you what is the difference between the current state of the code and uh, the previous state of the code. Um, it helps you remember to do things like remove your debug statements, 
Um, I like to use it to make sure that I only changed as much as I actually needed to change. Um, it's really easy, you know, you're working on a Drupal project, you might have nine different files open at once. And you might be trying things over here, trying things over here. Um, you might get a phone call in the middle of it, and you have to write down a phone number right quick, and you accidentally write that into a comment. <laughs> but you don't see it because it's in gray, so you just, your mind doesn't see it. Git diff will let you see really quickly, oh, I put a, I put a phone number in that file. Um, this is a lesson I learned. Uh, I used to use the word butts as my standard uh, <laughs> debug output. Um, if I saw butts, I knew things were working. If I didn't see butts, I knew they were broken. And then one time I accidentally committed that to master. Um, that is a mistake you only make once, <laughs> believe me. Um, get blame. It helps you find your enemies. No, no it doesn't. Um, get blame is your friend. Um, it's also known as get annotate. Um, I think annotate, it's a lot more to type, but it's a, it's a friendlier word than blame. Um, what git annotate does is it tells you for every line of a file, who was the last person to change that line. Um, so, you know, if you're working on a team of one, it's really easy, it was me. I was the dummy that did that thing. Um, but I currently work uh, on a code base that has, you know, something like 12 to 15 active contributors across various teams. Um, and I need to know, oh, why is, this, why is this variable like this? I know this is wrong. I can say, oh, that was Bill. Um, but you shouldn't make it a witch hunt. You know, this, this is a tool to help you uh, get some, some context around the issue. Maybe what's wrong to me is right to him. And so we need to have a conversation about how to make this one thing work for both of our teams. Um, and so that's something that this can help you do. Um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to find an error, hit get blame, and then yell at somebody. Um, but it's a, a, better, a better idea to use it as an opportunity to find out why did they do that thing? You know, where did they learn how to do this one type of you know, coding trick? Or why did they think that this should be built like this? Um, as you work on bigger and bigger projects, it becomes more important to know that, oh, well, you know, on our side, um, we align everything to the left. But you guys align everything to the right. So let's figure out how to make it work for both of us. Um, let's take a look at some other debugging techniques. Um, so, when you're working on something, um, you know, once it's, once it's fixed, once it's no longer broken in production, um, and you're taking your time to like kind of understand the actual underlying issue, uh, one, one thing I really like to do is walk away. Just stand up, go for a walk. Uh, grab a coffee, go around the block. Um, you know, get your mind away from the keyboard um, and start thinking about the problem in your head instead of with your fingers. Um, I find that super useful. Um, talk to a coworker. It's really nice. Uh, if you don't have a coworker at the moment, talk to a rubber duck. Um, if anybody uh, isn't familiar, uh, rubber ducking um, is a, a coding style wherein you explain your problem to an inanimate object um, or somebody who just has no idea what you're talking about. Uh, because by having to explain it fully and in detail, you might come across something that you missed. Um, because you know, you, as you're thinking about things, you kind, of, you kind of grind ruts into your brain, and you can only think about it in that certain way. Um, but maybe you talk to a rubber duck, and you realize, oh, I missed something super obvious. Or maybe it's not so obvious. Maybe you, know, you just couldn't take that right turn when you needed to take the right turn. Um, something I really like to do, something I've gotten into more lately, is write it down by hand. Um, it's one thing to keep a, you know, like a, a notebook uh, on your computer where you can type things, uh, but taking your brain out of that physical mode of typing and make it do something like physically writing actually changes your cognition. Um, and so I find it super useful when I'm going down those deep rabbit holes um, to start taking notes. Um, you know, I had an issue once where we had, you know, it was a, a nested if-then situation that had, I forget what it was, it was like 12 different outcomes. So if then, then that. If this, then that. If this, then that. And I couldn't figure out why things weren't working because we had, like, everything was there. All of the, you know, the marbles were falling through the proper gates. Um, but when I actually sat down and wrote it out by hand, like made a chart and made check boxes and X's, I realized that we were missing two whole conditions for all of these inputs. Um, and that's something that, like, looking at the code, my brain wouldn't let me figure out. But as soon as I, like, drew something out physically by hand, it clicked instantly. It made a lot of sense. Um, 
once you've fixed the problem, once you understand what the problem was, you've fixed it, everybody's happy, um, you're not done. You, know, you may think you're done, but maybe you're not done. Maybe it's time to do a little proactive debugging. Um, so this is something where you fix the problem, you know what caused the problem, now try to prevent that problem from happening in the future. Or try to put something in place to where you can find what happened easier. Um, so write a watchdog statement, or in a Drupal 8, a Drupal logger statement, so that you can see these issues before they become big issues. Um, so anytime, you know, maybe it's not worth it to fix a super edge case, but every time it happens, you can write a, a file to the log, and then you've got 20, 20 reasons for your boss to give you the time to fix that thing, um, which is really nice. Uh, the syslog module, um, uh, yeah, so syslog, um, it just it replaces watchdog and lets you write things to disk, which lets you do cool things like use uh, an elastic search to visualize all of your logs. Um, there's a company called Logly and another one called Sumo Logic that both do this where they'll aggregate all of your log files and let you really quickly and easily search through them for specific issues, which is really nice. So as you're writing these, these logs, you can, you can find them, you can graph them, you can chart them, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. Um, write a test. You know, hopefully you're writing tests. Uh, it's kind of new to the Drupal world, uh, but it's super useful. Um, it could be a simple test, a PhD unit, it can be a BHAT. Um, so simple test uh, lets you write tests against your code. BHAT lets you write tests against the behaviors of your site. Um, so BHAT is really cool. A lot of Drupal people are using it now. Um, so it's stuff like uh, you, write, you write a test that says, if I log in as a specific type of user, I should see these seven things on the page. And if I don't see one of them, the test fails. Um, so this is really good for you know, visual testing. It's really good for permissions-based testing. Um, it's good to make sure that, you know, if I'm not logged in as admin, I shouldn't be able to look at the admin pages. These are the types of tests you can write with that. Um, so this is the further reading. Um, art of troubleshooting, uh, debugging the nine indispensable rules, um, debugging during development, uh, PHP Storm Debugger, Maniac McGee, I love that book. Um, thank you. Questions, war stories. How's everybody doing? Yeah. So we, uh, we're slowly transitioning to PHP Storm. Uh, I'm a huge uh, champion of it in our company. I'm trying to get our team to move over to it. And I, I can definitely echo everything you said where it definitely makes you a better developer. Mm -hmm. A lot of the issues you set up, like writing a variable that doesn't exist, it tells you right away. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you uh, put a single quote and a double quote, quote, it tells you right away. Uh, it'll even give you suggestions for performance improvements. If you use, like if you're doing jQuery and you've declared the same variable twice, it says, why are you doing it twice? It catches things proactively. The only downside of trouble I have with uh, trying to get our team to adopt it is it's heavy to open. Like a lot of people use text wrangler or Sublime or something like that to quickly open something. PHP Storm takes like 30 seconds. And I guess that's such a big hurdle for people. So I always have it open. Uh, and then it has Git implementation as well. So a lot of what you said is in there. It just makes it accessible. So you can right click a line, a file, and see the history of it to, to see who made a change at what point. And it's kind of visual. So I think uh, the sooner people get onto PHP Storm, the sooner you get these kind of advantages and, and really optimize your work before it becomes a problem. Yeah. Uh, and I'll say, like, I use PHP Storm every day, but it's not the only thing I use. Right. Um, so, you know, if you just want to make a quick fix, I'll jump into them. Um, I'll jump into Atom, because those are, those are faster. They're way more lightweight. Um, the thing about PHP Storm, for a lot of the benefits, it has to be based on a project. So you have to tell it, like, your entire site. It has to index that entire site. Every once in a while, it has to re-index that entire site. Um, so it's really good for the big stuff. But yeah, for, for little things, I'll definitely pop up some other stuff uh, just for quick fixes. Really nice. Any other questions? Yes, I did it perfectly. <laughs> Everybody learned everything. Yes. Um, just because you mentioned Blackfire, there's a talk later this afternoon about how to use Blackfire on your Drupal site. Awesome. Any interested in that? Yeah, that sounds great. Everybody should go check out the Blackfire talk. Cool. Thank you all very much. Y'all have a good lunch. Thanks.